Hello, hello, hello. I'm uh, I'm back here under the graphic somewhere. Let me uh, turn off the graphic. And uh, yeah, there we are. And I'll uh, I'll do this. We're doing Philo today again. We are on episode eight. I've named this episode Kaiju Court. Um, and uh, I, I'm going to start letting people know what I've named the episodes, but uh, I'm still not going to put them in the the descriptions or anything. It's just going to be the placard and me saying, "Oh, that's what this is." So, uh, so yeah. So where we left off previous previously on Philo. As soon as I get my pen here. Um, Shouldn't say Santa God's defense lawyer arrives. Uh, yeah, but I had it it cut off. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. Was and so, uh, where we started off was Godzilla brings Philo in front of the Kaiju Tribunal, and um, I only got three panels done last time because I had a lot of research. Uh, there's a the trial. Handcuffs are awesome. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, it also looks great. And then uh, Senegal defense, uh, Senegal's defense lawyer bursts through the door, Perfect. which happens to be Manila, which is Godzilla's adopted son. Yes. Yes. And so that's where we left off. And so uh, I am going to turn that off. This was uh, kind of what we did. And then um, duplicate layer. Let's do that. And let's turn that on. So what happens next? That was a good start, actually. That was really a good idea. Mm. I mean, well, in my came head, in. I see uh, Senti God, all of them, just doing this like big whew, sigh of relief because mm -hmm. they they're like a gog. They have no idea what's going on. It's been this whirlwind where they've all of a sudden there's rules, and then Godzilla's dragging them to a tribunal. So they're like, ah. Well, I mean, to, God to shows be fair. Up. To be fair, Santa God's been a kaiju for about five minutes. And mm -hmm. so he doesn't know what ka the kaiju rules are. And exactly. so Manila, as as one of the smaller kaijus, is a good, uh, I guess, um, uh, bridge for that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, so I guess Manila then would, would make... So I, you'd show him in front statements? of the... Sorry? I guess Manila would make opening statements. Yes, that's exactly yes. right. Perfect. Okay, so be like let's... show him in front of the tribunal. Yeah, opening yeah. statements is exactly what would happen. Okay, so um, uh, Manila and Godzilla um, perform their opening statements. Yes. Perform perfect word well, perform. is perform a good word okay perform well i mean there's no other word i mean even lawyers would agree that that's address a good word their opening statements i don't know, I don't know um, have their opening statements begin their opening statements Ooh. opening statements um, well, if they're both beginning, then that implies that they're gonna, like, have longer statements, right? You know, like, are they gonna be back and forth? Because usually opening statements is it's one side. Yeah. Yeah. And one side thing. will say, this is our case, and the other side says, this is what we'll Godzilla prove. and Godzilla. Um, prepare for the trial of their lives. Well, you know, that sets us back because opening statements that that moves yeah. forward a little bit. So let's have uh, Manila and Godzilla have their opening statements. All right. And then that will allow me to draw the tribunal once more. And, um, you know, in the whole trial setting and like I am a huge fan of trial TV, you know, like judge judy and all of that have you I, have you heard the latest gossip the latest canadian gossip oh what's the latest canadian gossip so they've got a law and order toronto right now it just a premiere and i think yesterday okay and everyone's upset because they mispronounced toronto what do they say instead okay well the thing about toronto is if you're from toronto you don't say the second t it's toronto you see how I'm saying it? Toronto. 
Yeah, okay. So no it has a soft Toronto. It has a silent yeah. T. Well, the... it's the way the locals pronounce it. Toronto. Yeah. Yeah. Toronto. 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 Yeah. So yeah, but I guess they ran around saying Toronto all the time. <laughs> so us Canadians are so upset. If you're gonna do a show in our city, get the city name right. You know, and and that being said, uh, like you had shows like the X Files that turned um, the Pacific Northwest uh, into like every part of the country, every yeah. part of the world. I you will, know, like, Vancouver, yeah. right? Yeah, you know, it, like it was all rainy. You know, it's like, oh, we're in we're in Arizona and it's raining and green. <laughs> my favorite, if my one of the first times that happened to me, where I was just like marvelled over it, was uh, my friend Keith was in this movie called Romeo I Must Die. And oh, it's a, it's a Jet Li movie. No, I know oh. Romeo Must Die. Okay, yes. so my friend I, Jet Li is is respected in this house. Oh, cool. Yeah. So my friend Keith is the guy, the big black guy who gets beat up by the scrawny Asian guy at the very beginning of the movie at the club. Nice. And I, I know him through comics. Like he used to shop at the store that I, I managed for a very long time. Anyway, mm -hmm. so uh, that film, obviously, that whole thing was filmed in Vancouver. But like the first opening shots, the, it looks like they're driving into Los Angeles. <laughs> Yeah. And I don't know if they did those opening shots in Los Angeles and did the rest in Vancouver, but it's just, it's so bizarre when you see that. Another another big one is uh, Jackie Chan's Rumble in the Bronx, I think it was. Yeah. It was filmed yeah. in Vancouver as well. And like, sometimes it's just bizarre. It's like doubling for Croatia or, mm -hmm. you know, like, yeah. it's interesting. Well, I mean, um, Atlanta uh, in Georgia has mm -hmm. uh, developed this really good, uh, kind of homespun um, uh, film industry, you know, where it, it, television industry as well and stuff. But they they have like such wilderness out in the south that area that you know you throw I... some fake snow on it and suddenly you're you're you know in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> like they they've been able to turn that wilderness into a lot. Well, I mean, the whole point that they started filming in Vancouver and stuff is because they were getting insane tax breaks. And then with the exchange rate, it just made sense. But I don't think it does as much anymore. But maybe it's just such an entrenched, uh, established place to make stuff that it's just easier now. I mean, mm -hmm. people, they have their crews that they like to work with, right? And if uh, the crew's in BC, then they'll go there, I guess. But there's also, I gotta, there's gotta be like, get legal laws and stuff like you know about international acting and working and stuff because i yeah. know at one point i was going to work at previews you know that magazine yeah. that promotes yeah. like comics and no i know what previews is yeah. yeah so and i went through a whole bunch of interviews like there was about four interviews and at one point i was supposed to drive down to maryland um and do like my final interview um uh -huh. Because the thing was, is I knew more about their products than the people they were hiring, right? Yeah. But yeah. the thing was, is I want that. That's, that's how why... Mark Wade got a job. Oh, yeah. Is, well, just a total tangent for a second. Uh, Mark Wade used to write into the letters pages at Marvel, right? And say, you guys screwed up this, this comic, you know, this issue, this panel, blah, blah, blah. He, you know, Thor says this, but in mm -hmm. this issue, this comic, this panel, Thor says this. So which is it? He was that guy. And um, he knew Paul so Levitt's much about it that basically, I don't know, I don't know if it was spiteful that they're like, well, why don't you just try writing something and it happened to be good? Or if he just was was the one that's like, I'm going to try writing something You're and, and it happened to be good. Yeah. yeah. So I, I don't know like who initiated it of, of his first script, but it happened to be good. And they knew he knew his stuff. And so yeah. that's how Mark Wade got hired. But I, I digress. So. Uh, you were well, in the middle of the story. He's got a long storied career, so he yeah. definitely knew what he was doing. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, probably one of my favorite things that he wrote was Kingdom Come. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the first Superman turns evil stories. You know, it, it's, I don't know, I like it. Wasn't it also one of the first times that they were like Superman and Wonder Woman were together? Uh, I don't. Remember if they were together, but she goes to 
she she goes to his fortress of solitude to get him out of his like fake Kansas bubble where he's been living. That's like a holodeck. Yeah. And and it's like, you know, all this shit's happened in the world. The world needs Superman again, right? Only the Superman that comes back is like, do it my way, bitches. And um and there's a lot of people that are like, uh, Superman ain't the the bright shiny guy that he used to be. He wants to enslave half half of the uh 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 powered people, mm-hmm. you know? Um Yeah, I just remember yeah. the Alex Ross art mostly. Yeah, Brian, well, um, Brian Azzarello did a story like that that was really good about um, how it was called Hope. And yeah. it was about how Lex Luthor was like, you guys don't realize, but you're facilitating an alien who could wipe everybody out in one second. Yeah. Like, we need to have our own hero that we can control. And so he created this character called Hope or this hero called Hope. Yeah. It was illustrated by Lee Brumijo, who I freaking love. His work is so good. But yeah, mm-hmm. Brian Azzarello is a really good writer, too. I don't have a lot what of... What else has uh, Brian Azzarello written? Oh my gosh, 100 Bullets is his biggest. Oh, oh my gosh, I was impressed with that. Yeah. The dialogue in 100 Bullets was so natural. You and know, you want to like, hear a crazy like, story? You believe these people ex- like yeah, he's exist. a great writer, Brian. Yeah, but listen to this crazy story because it's not going to be told very much often anymore because they are now uh, divorced. But Brian Azzarello, I do believe he lived in Chicago and he met Jill Thompson at a party. And you know who that artist is, right? Yeah, Jill and I are friends. Okay, so. He met Jill at a party and they didn't know that each other did comics and they kind of kept it a secret for a while because, you know, it's kind of stigmatized a bit. And yeah. finally, got one, and they had other things in common. Like, I think yeah. they're really big wrestling fans. Mm-hmm. So at one point, I think she kind of let slip that she did comics and he was like, oh, no way. He's like, I write comics too. And like, they didn't really realize who each other was. Yeah. Like, I don't think they knew who's had recognized each other's work you know what i mean yeah and they just kind of fallen in love without the comics being a thing until later (laughs) it's just funny yeah it 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 it, it's interesting because yeah uh stan lee wanted to he says he wanted to make comics cool because he was embarrassed to tell people that that's what he did at at cocktail parties and it's interesting that you know 30 years later you still have that problem with Jill Thompson, who's like one of the fairy godmother. I yeah. mean, one of the well, no, even prior to Scary Godmother, I mean, she was scary, at yeah, Wonder Woman and yeah. Sandman and like yeah. tons of stuff. Black Orchid, like she, yeah, she's a, such a good artist. But uh-huh. yeah, obviously, Scary Godmother is like her ballet work. But well, that's that's her uh, her like creator own yeah. property. That's one of my holy grails is to get the scary godmother toy. I have the original hardcovers. I have everything. Yeah. She only had she only had like a thousand of them made or something I know, like but that. Like it's he, a really small he amount. I found some like two or three years ago in some, I don't know, storage facility and they were mm-hmm. selling them on Instagram and I, I missed it by like a month or something. Yeah. And I sent a message, but I never got a message back. But yeah, I would love to get a scary godmother doll. Aww. Yeah, I uh, I know when those came out, she, uh, I think she only made them for her patrons, you know, on Patreon. No, I, I was, you could buy them because I remember, because I saw, I was in China when they came out. And when I, mm-hmm. when I found out about them, I tried to get a hold of her to find out if I could get them. And she, it, I don't think it was just for the patrons, Patreon. I don't even know if Patreon was a thing in 2013. Uh, I don't know. Computer, when did Patreon start? Patreon was launched on May 2nd, 2013. May 2nd, 2013. No. I was in China at that time. Oh, no, wait, no. May 2013? No, I wasn't. It's August 2013 I started living in China. Yeah. So, I mean, but that's when it started. She might have had the, uh, she might have had the, the, uh, Patreon thing after that. Yeah. But yeah, I, I seem to recall that like they were the ones that basically paid for it. And so they got the majority of them. And I think there was like a small handful that were extra and those were gone right away. Do you mean like a Kickstarter? It might have been a Kickstarter. Yeah, I think that's what yeah. it was. That makes more sense to me than a patron. Uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry. It was yeah. 
it yeah, probably I, was a, a Kickstarter. Kickstarter is what it was. That makes a lot more sense to me. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I'm. This image is know, looking been, awesome, by the way. This is perfect. Well, I'm I'm having them addressing the but yeah, but like Godzilla dad being furious, and then like Manila's son just being exasperated. No, it's I'm like thinking. Bit... I'm thinking with Godzilla being uh, now he is the prosecutor. He should probably have glasses and a tie. You know, like he's slowly morphing. Well, he's got the briefcase, okay? Well, I still have to draw in the briefcase, so. Yeah. Briefcase is shorthand for business. Is it it's like more? eyelashes is shorthand for girl. Yeah, I suppose that's true. And long hair. Yeah. Um, back in you know, ancient... it's funny that you mentioned that about Stan Lee because I remember reading a long time ago that when he started, he he was definitely embarrassed, but it was just like a gig to him. His dream yeah. was to write the great American novel and that yeah. comics were like beneath him. Yeah. Yeah. But in the end, comics were bread and butter and he shouldn't have been so dismissive. Uh, Dan Raviv wrote a book about uh, Marvel. You yeah. Know, and, and how uh, Marvel was like, how it operated behind the scenes, right? He yeah. kind of turned everybody into characters. There was dialogue in it. So it wasn't like completely factual, but it was like, this is what happened kind of thing. What was the title? Because I usually buy most of those books that are about Marvel. Uh, let me check, let me check, let me check. Because I've got like Comic you... Wars and I've got the one that's It might have been Karma, Comic Toy World Biz. Wars. There was the one about Toy Biz where it was all about their bankruptcy. There's a bunch of them that I have. I'm kind of a secret Marvel yeah. addict. Yeah, it is Comic Wars. Yeah, I've read that. It's a really good book. Yeah, Ma Marvel's Battle for Survival. Yeah, very good book. Um, but yeah, it, it talks about that in there. Um, about the, the fact that he's just like, okay, I'm just going to do this for a little bit. And he could never get a job outside. Like, he couldn't write for magazines. He tried to write for Playboy. And you the know, only reason he had the Marvel gig is because his uncle his gave uncle him owned it. the company. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And everyone forgets that. that no, well, nobody cares. They just don't. They just fall for his uh, his showmanship, right? He's such a shyster huckster guy. Well, let's let's be fair to the legacy of who he was. Yes. He was he P.T. Barnum. Legacy. Yes, it well, that's okay. what I'm saying. He's a yeah. shyster huckster. This P.T. Barnum is the perfect example. Yeah, he was P.T. Barnum. Is he was a showman and he knew how to bring the crowds in. You know, he's also the ringleader. He was the guy that corralled all the people, not the fans, but I mean like the artists and the writers, put them together. Yeah, and um, how he used to write was in the morning. He would basically say, okay, uh, you two, I, I want you to make a Spider-Man story where he's fighting the Vulture. You two, I want you guys to, to make a, uh, an X-Men story, I don't know, where uh, Magneto steals a Capitol building or something. Figure it out, right? Mm -hmm. And then I, I want you two in the back like working on uh, New Mutant stuff for us and, and we'll figure it out, right? And um, he would have the artists do everything. The artist would write it out. The artist would put in dialogue, actually in pencil, right? And then they would put in the margins stuff, like story-wise going on, like Thor says this. And mm -hmm. then when it ended up on Stan's desk, Stan figured out what they said exactly for the letters to letter and put on the page before it, it reached the colorist. Yep. And it was being lettered and inked concurrently with each other. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, I mean, he, he, that elevator pitch, like, he kept in his head that, like, okay, yeah, they have the vulture this week, but he wasn't the one that came up with the vulture wanted to kill Mary Jane because he discovered her, you know, Spider-Man's secret identity and, you know, all, like, all of that stuff, like, the actual nitty-gritty of the story, the yeah. artists were the ones that did that. Exactly. Plus, yeah. the artists were the ones that came with the characters, how they looked, how they talked. Yeah like who yeah. they were yeah honestly and like it's frustrating because people really want to make stan lee like the 
be all and end all of Marvel, but like you've got to well, give credit to Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko. And when you, it's, it's not the be all and all. And all uh, it's not the be all end all. Uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like myth that gets me. It it's the um, um, what's the word I'm 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 talking about? It's it dismisses the work of the artists, and you know him taking credit for everything like that. I don't think I could have worked with the guy. I think I would have oh, walked out like Steve Ditko. You yeah. know. Like, cause that's the kind of shit that uh, Steve Ditko walked out for is he didn't like the fact that he wasn't getting credit for his work. He didn't like the fact that he wasn't getting paid for his work, you yeah. know? And because Stan Lee's father owned the company. No, not his father, his uncle. Or his uncle owned the company. Yes. I'm sorry. Um, Jack Kirby, the same. And when you see like Kirby's output outside of Marvel, the dude was a fucking genius. genius. Oh yeah capital G and it took me 20 years of immersive comic study to get to that point but mm -hmm. I now respect him a lot more than I used to when I what? first got into comics people were always like Jack Kirby Jack Kirby Jack Kirby yeah. and it's always guys right and it's, yeah it's the same with books they're always like oh Henry Miller or oh Italiano Calvino it's like these like token guys that they're always pushing on you right Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, props to Kirby. He was one of the guys who created romance comics. And I love romance comics. I have a giant collection of romance comics. You know, I've never props read one. Kirby. Sorry? They, they seem kind of um, corny to me. They're hella corny. Yeah. They're written by men for women and girls. Like, what do you think they are? Some of them are awful, but they're hilarious. And some of them are just beautiful to look at. Like, I got this one recently at a con in the summer, and I was like, this is so cheesy. But then all of a sudden, this panel came into view, and it was just... Let me see if I can find it, because I think I still have it here next to me. Um. Anyways, my point is... But I was always like, but Kirby draws all his women exactly the same, but with different hairstyles. Mm -hmm. and when you look at his superhero comics, it's the same kind of thing, right? So I just didn't give it the time of day. I think the first thing I read of his was the Silver Surfer he did. Mm -hmm. But recent, I always gave him respect, though. Like, I was like, respect. I mean, he did the X-Men. Respect. Mm -hmm. There's other things he did, too. Like, I think he did Captain America, too. So respect. I give him tons of respect. He invented Captain America with Joe Simon. Exactly. Right? He's also in the fact, guy who created In fact, that's how Marvel got Jack Kirby, was... Mm -hmm. They basically bought Captain America and the team with it. Mm -hmm. And that's how Joe Simon and Jack Kirby started working for uh, for Marvel. And at that time, Stan basically, he saw he saw the genius. And he he knew he could exploit this immigrant. He sure did. You know, yeah. And he and he did. And he did. Yeah. And he did. Okay. But recently, let me see uh, how... I saw my, a documentary written, done by these French guys about Jack Kirby at war. You can see yeah. it on Tubi. My, my favorite art is his war art from World War II. Yeah. The, the stuff crazy. that he did where he was just sketching in his sketchbook, mm -hmm. right, of whatever was in front of him. There's so much weight mm -hmm. and, and it, it's soft and yet, you know, has the gritty lines. It has like these little hints and moments of later Kirby in them you know but at the same time it's it's what was in front of them right yeah so i it, it's it's uh i don't know i i'm i'm losing my train of thought because i'm uh drawing well, at the same time and my point was is i after watching that documentary they they showed a whole bunch of his work that he did in the 70s mm -hmm. and late 60s and it was yeah. like super psychedelic all this yeah. intense robot stuff with like super intricate line work and just like uh it just blew my mind when i saw that stuff and i was like i have never seen this side of kirby it's mm -hmm. like omac yeah. the that's series. the stuff he was doing for um, dc like yeah when it's he a invented, lot of DC stuff yeah, yeah when he invented dark side mm -hmm. like all of, of yeah, yeah all of dark sides yeah. like 
world, right? I forget what it's what his hella cool. Called. I yeah. I was just so impressed. And so that's when I was just like, okay, that's it. I'm a I'm a Kirby fanatic. Yeah, um <laughs> I get I, it now. I have a Kirby story of the one time I met him when I was six years old. You met him when you were six years old? I I was at San Diego Comic Con. I was there with my family. And my brother and I were supposed to be walking together and my brother was walking ahead of me and I was trying to walk fast. And basically I collided with this guy that just kind of tossed me down. And, and I, I was sprayed out in the, you know, in the aisle. And so, uh, I got picked up and it's like, no, we're going to find this guy. Right. And, and then I'm like basically being ushered through the crowd by, by this dude and the crowd's parting. And he's like, you got to apologize to this girl for knocking her down. And, and the guy's like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to knock you down and stuff like that. And he leans down. He says, hey, you okay, kid? And I'm like, yeah, I'm okay. And he, he uh, uh, says, you know, who's your favorite superhero? And I'm like, you know, oh, I don't know, but I like Spider-Man. And so he drew me a Spider-Man, mm -hmm. signed it, and then, you know, said, hey, be careful out there, you know, kind of thing. And then I went and I caught up to my brother and stuff. Yeah. Years later, I found that Spider-Man and it was signed Jack Kirby. That's crazy. Yeah. And it was like, what? <laughs> it's like, you know, the thing was, is he saw, he saw some kind of slight and, yeah. and he, he just, I have to fix this. Yeah. And that was Jack Kirby. That's cool. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah. And so, uh, that was, here's that panel I was telling you about in the romance comic that is really awesome check it out oh that's sweet with like the waves is is like part of her silhouette and yeah like inside that's, um, them so are i didn't know this i posted it i was talking to uh diana schutz because she's yeah. the only other person i really know that collects romance comics a lot yeah um and she looked it up and she discovered that was alex toth huh or Toth, I guess you pronounce it Alex Toth. But I just, I couldn't believe it. I mean, he's inked by somebody else. I want to say it's Val Semex, but I could be wrong. Yeah. But yeah, it, like it doesn't really look like him, but still the creativity of his ingenuity shines through whether he likes it or not. Because the rest of it's pretty cheesy. Mm -hmm. But um, so that's the thing. Sometimes you just get these wonderful, wonderful panels. Um, there's a really great cartoonist called Elizabeth Baroub, and mm -hmm. she she does a lot of good stuff in DC. And they're usually just little vignettes where she'll do like horoscope art, or she'll do like fashions of the day where it'll be like, oh, hats are in, and there's a bunch of drawings of girls and hats. But her uh, work is so cool. And have different. you uh, have you heard of? Um, um, oh gosh, my brain just totally spazzed. Uh, Oh my gosh, my brain just totally spazzed. It was something to do with romance comics. I'm sorry. I, I'm I'm having a rough night tonight. I should probably tell our audience. Ooh, that's pretty. Um, I should probably tell our audience that uh, I've been sick in bed all day and uh, doing pretty good. I got to tell you, trying, but um, I'm You're taking a long time on this panel. So. So I think I'm done with this panel. Manila and Godzilla have their opening statements, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm done with this panel because you know we have the the synagogue in the side here, and then um, let us do panel two. So let me set that up. Awesome. So okay, what's next? Good God, I don't know, and we don't have any guests. Uh, not yet. But that's okay. They'll uh, come. They'll come. <laughs> let's see. Let's do this. We'll we'll do that, and then uh, let me duplicate my. What happens next? Who should the judge be? Oh, it's Mothra. Mothra's the judge. Um, we have Mothra. We have uh, Gamera, and we have King Kong as the three judges on the tribunal. Like, should they listen intently? Like, should we say the judges listen intently and just draw them going? No, nah, that's a given. <laughs> no, no, it is a given. That's why they're all there. So why wouldn't they be listening intently? It's part of what. Well, uh, it's part of the. Uh, they need to do something. Always work. <laughs> no, but they need to do something. Like they need to react, or something needs to happen to make them react. Yeah. Like, I keep thinking, you know how like. Um, 
Wait, so, oh, like if a dog inspiration. sitting there. Inspiration, inspiration. Okay. Sent to God is the kaiju. If sent to God is no longer sent to God and has split into the four creatures that make sent to God, sent to God is no longer a kaiju. Yeah, therefore he's not disobeying the rules. Yeah, and 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 the tr you know the trial would be thrown out. It'd be a mistrial because there's no. So that's there's the no... next thing. But what so, what's the catalyst to make that happen? Like, do they need something thrown on them? Like some kind of formula, or do they all just decide to spontaneously break apart? Or I imagine that they just lose cohesion somehow. You know, that just like over over a period of time they can't like maintain the Sentagod form for long. It's kind of like it's kind of like Ooh, Voltron, right? Idea. What about yeah. like what if like a police siren goes by or something and just that weird awful noise is enough to break them apart? Ooh, I like that. Okay, let's do that. All right. Uh... Or something like that. Like I can't think of another irritating noise that would be so bad. Maybe a tsunami is about to arrive, and so that like air horn tsunami <laughs> noise. Uh, in a a courtroom, you have the gavel. You know. That's, yeah, but that's so. That's not as intense. The tic tac from the stenographer. Hey, you know, have you shown the stenographer yet? We were. Going I have to not that. shown the stenographer yet. All right. But that's adding another character. I'm honestly thinking. I thought we need you wanted to, start... to though. I thought you said that last time we needed a stenographer. Well, no, that was that was Dale who oh, was okay. uh, uh, talking in the comments and stuff like My that. Mistake. Who decided not to join us tonight? That's too bad. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, that was that. But uh, the cat so, cam looks so cute today too. Sent to God loses cohesion right there in the courtroom. Yeah, but like we should have it be like there's got to be like a noise, like a. Dude, wait, that, wait, like, wait, wait. Sent Kaiju need to eat massive amounts of food, mm -hmm. and Santa God hasn't eaten anything. Oh. Due to due to being hungry. Right. Remember, this all started with pasta. <laughs> The dog ate the pasta, so the pasta's no, done. No, no, the puma ate the pasta. Oh, the puma ate the pasta in the end, yes. Yes, but that doesn't mean anybody else had, you know, pasta. <gasps> Okay, I got it. The ice cream truck comes by, and <gasps> the music from the ice cream truck is what splits them apart, because they're starving, and they go okay. to the ice cream truck. Okay. Um... You know, the ice cream truck? The An guy. ice cream truck outside playing music. Oh, that's awkward. Don't worry it like um, that. Right, um... In the distance, the tinkling of an ice cream truck. An ice cream truck plays music. Well, I'm. it has to be very short. Because, right. you know, only like two... Two sentences. Right. And so an ice, an ice cream, cream truck, truck plays music, music from the distance. In the up, distance. Um causing no. Well that would oh you're gonna do it in this time. Okay, uh then we gotta make it even shorter then because you gotta put in the part that where they're gonna break apart. Ice the arrival cream. of an ice cream truck splits Sent to God apart. And I shortened it to an ice cream truck's music. Okay. Wait, an ice cream truck outside's music. No, put outside at the beginning. Outside, comma, an ice cream truck's music split sent to God apart. Okay. Okay, split synagogue apart. All right, now I got to figure out how to draw that. <laughs> Maybe put one creature in each corner of the panel and it just like bursts, a burst in the center. Well, because they've split apart. I'm thinking. We have 
the courthouse, right? Because because we're just kind of showing establishing, right? And all I'm going to do is just write courthouse in here. And I'll make it nice in a second, but we'll do that. We'll make it look like it's kind of like a old building, I guess. I'll give it steps like the New York City courthouse. Okay. All right. So there's the courthouse there, and then we'll have the road with the ice cream truck. Right. He's going to be driving. He has no idea what's going on. There's going to be uh, like a little thing have on musical him. Musical notes. Yeah. Musical notes. And then yeah, we'll do windows. Okay, so we'll do that. And then we'll have the musical notes come down here into the other panel. Perfect. Right, so that you know it's affecting him. And then I think. Oh, what wait. Are we gonna do? In the dialogue, you need to take out the N, just put capital O. And then comma, A N ice cream trucks music split sent it got apart. What? Just outside? Oh, like outside. outside comma, comma, and okay. yeah, perfect. And ice cream trucks music split sent it got apart. Okay, yes, yes, English. Okay. Um, let's, see, let's get back to the sketch layer, and then how am I going to split them apart? Well, that's what like, I'm saying. You gotta do the explosion. So, explosion. It's a out, but then it's done. <laughs> Bam. Yeah, I guess we'll have the Bluto uh, Puma. Or the Bluto Puma here. You'll be like, ah, oh, I'm a Bluto Puma. With his hat. And I'll have the hat finally come off the puma so I don't have to draw the hat anymore. Um, and then we will have the dog. And so I think the dog's going to be having a good time. So his, his tongue's going to be hanging out. You know. It's the most like, adventure he's had in a long time. Well, you know, like, we we don't know the kind of life that Philo lives uh, with the it, this might be, you know, just run of the mill for him. We're going to do that. And then we will have Philo. Do a proper explosion uh, pose, you know. And he's like, ah. Oh. And then we're going to have Otis. Not caring at all. Because he's just, nothing faces Otis. He's just like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I mean, we don't know if Otis has a personality. Well, I, I just kind of think of him like a, a little like a zombie. Just a little. Just a little. Just a little like a zombie. Okay. So, I still think of him as a homunculus man. What is it? That's what it's called, right? A homunc homunculus man? Homunc I'm not sure. What is that character in Hellboy? Roger. Roger. Yeah. Roger from Hellboy comic. I love the internet. Homunculus, you know? a humanoid being said to be created by means of alchemy. Was it alchemy, though, that created him? That's, I'm looking at a. Or was it science? Human. Well, isn't alchemy and science similar? Uh, I guess there's I a bit know. of magic in alchemy. See, that, I'm spending way too long on this ice cream truck for what it is. Roger was discovered in 1997 in a medieval alchemist lab beneath the ruins of a castle in Romania. There we go. That's outside. He is created from blood and herbs stewed in a jar and then incubated in horse manure Ew. lifeless upon discovery roger was activated when liz touched the socket on his chest absorbing her 
pyrokinesis as she was subconsciously looking to rid herself of it. Liz entered a coma. Roger sprang to life in a violent rage. Huh. Anyways. Yeah. That's kind of what I think Otis is. See, I, I see him more as like the clones in multiplicity where like the more you make, the more different they are from each other. Right? Because they're all just slightly different. Like the DNA is slightly different. And then one of the clones decides to clone himself and then makes a really stupid clone. Have you ever seen that movie with Michael Keaton? No. It's it's like a, it like a 90s yeah movie? it's like adorable yeah multiplicity and it has a cover of michael keaton with a bunch of other michael keaton's behind him 1996 yep was it before your time no uh i was one year out of high school in 1996 Ah, oh, you're slightly older uh, than me. Andy McDowell and Eugene Levy in it, so that's pretty cool. I'm surprised you'd never heard of it before. No. Yeah, it. I have. Never. It's uh, it, it's really cute. Um, he used to be a scientist, and then his wife starts being the breadwinner, and so he's at home. He's Mr. Mom. And he has mm -hmm. to, to figure out how to do everything. Which is ironic because he literally played Mr. Mom in the movie Mr. Yes, Mom. Yes, exactly. And and so they're they're playing on that, right? And so he's mm -hmm. having a really hard time being like, you know, getting everything done. And so he, he ends up cloning himself to have an extra help, right? Well, then he mm -hmm. clones himself again and he clones himself again. And he clones himself enough times that like there's someone for everybody one of the clones starts falling in love with his wife and saying but you really she's my wife because i'm you and the guy's like no you're not you're a clone it, it's yeah it, it's really it, it's a it's a cute movie it's a comedy i will look it yeah. up to watch yeah so uh and it's michael keaton doing what he does best which is comedy yeah he's good i like him I was quite surprised to see him as the Vulture in the new Spider-Mans, but he was very good. I I could see him as the Vulture. Um, I haven't seen any of the new Spider-Mans yet. It's not that I don't think All right, that's too bad. Yeah, it's not that I don't think they're good or anything like that. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. You should, because they're very good. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I heard that the writing was pretty good in them. Mm-hmm. Actually, one of the writers in, I think, the first two, I can't, I don't remember if he's in the third one, but uh, one of the writers in the first two is the kid who played Sam in uh, Freaks and Geeks. Hmm. Interesting. Let's see. Okay, we're just going to... Yeah, because Martin Starr plays a teacher in the Spider-Man TV uh, movie series, which is hmm. funny. I don't know. I quite like them, and then also the Into the Spider Verse series was really is really good too. I like that. A I lot. saw the first one. Um, I haven't seen the second one yet. It's quite but good. There's having, a lot of jokes, a, a lot of spider nerd jokes. Having a two year old though, it makes it really hard to watch like modern course, movies. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. And then of course you go to sleep pretty quick. There's no way you're staying awake just to watch a two hour. Well, movie. and not only that, but uh, like. You know, Ian likes horror movies and stuff, and so we'll watch horror mm -hmm. movies, you know, and she'll come in because, you know, she had a bad dream or she she's not getting comfortable <laughs> or whatever, and we bad. have to turn off the movie, you know, and yeah. it's like, oh, right, okay, and so, yeah. Uh, listen, I have major trauma because I saw Poltergeist at, like, age seven, eight years of age. So it, did I. Like, major trauma. Yeah, so did I. I watched well, it with my family. Maybe you were strong enough to deal with it, but I was not strong enough to deal with it. It affected my No, life. uh, what did it for me was uh, The Exorcist. Is when I was when I was like, I don't know, maybe about 11 through 13, kind of that age range, um, my mom said I was old enough to watch scary movies. And so I went on the scary movie binge and that was one of the movies that I picked up. And oh man, I, I was scared Linda Blair was gonna be in my bed for like, until I graduated high school. Yikes. Yeah, it was pretty bad. 
It's imagination, man. You just I have such an overactive imagination. I saw this uh TikTok video of this guy and he's like turning off the lights in his yeah. house. And yeah, yeah, and, the, and the dude that runs up behind him. There's a guy him. all dressed in black running up behind yeah. yeah, exactly. I'm like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Yeah, it's like, no, no, <laughs> we've like, all been there. We all we all know what yeah. you're talking about. Yeah. So the dog's Shivers. just happy as can be. <laughs> That's like my dog. Man. We just got him. Um, I didn't, obviously. He's like, I keep saying he's my dog, but he's my brother's dog. But I spend a lot of time mm -hmm. with him. But they just got him a haircut. So now he's like super cute and he looks all different. Because when they cut, air like Airedales are wire hair terrier. Mm -hmm. So when they grow out, they're super shaggy and it's almost like an afro. It's so fluffy. Yeah. And then when you shave them down, they're so small and skinny. They almost look like a drowned rat. You're just like, what happened to you? <laughs> But they're still super cute because then they're all slick and wiggly and then you can give them better scratches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, growing up, I had a Black Labs and a Golden Retriever. Oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Labs. Yeah, you know, they're not bad. We've only ever had Airedales. Yeah, also not bad. Um, Chuck has one of those. His name's Whiskey. Oh, really? Nice. I didn't yeah. know that. I have to talk to him about his Airedale. Because they're not common. Like, not a lot of people have them. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, like, you know, they're recognizable. Right? Like, mm -hmm. I want to say uh, an Airedale was one of the dogs in Lady and the Tramp, right? That was, like, helping him out. It's, it's a... Maybe? Uh, I know there's one in 101 Dalmatians. Like, I've seen it in the book. Mm. Airedale in... Maybe that's Lady. the one I'm thinking of. Maybe. And the trap. Ah, yeah, that's another movie that traumatized me as a child. Lady in the Tramp? Oh, yeah, there's, like, a whole series of Disney cartoons that my parents had to take me out of the theater for. Because, like, it would come out in the theaters back in the olden mm -hmm. days. This was before you could watch it on VHS and then subsequently DVD and then subsequently any streaming service. Mm -hmm. um, so they had to take me out of Lady and the Tramp because when they put her in jail, I kept crying about how it wasn't fair. She didn't do anything wrong. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they had to take me out of Bambi because you know who died and yeah. that was traumatic for me. They had to take me out of Dumbo because somebody died and that was traumatic for me. It was like this whole series of, oh, Fox and the Hound was another one. I was devastated at the end of Fox and the Hound. Oh. I was just like, why can't they be friends? Why can't they? And, you know, like my parents had to take me out. No, the only <laughs> movie I remember ever being taken out of in the movie theater was I was mm -hmm. probably about five or six, and my brother wanted to see Arachnophobia. And he's two years older oh, than me. That... And so my parents went, well, it's a comedy. You know, it, it's, it shouldn't be too scary. But seeing a big giant spider the size of a screen, you're five years old. Like, I remember my parents dragging me out of that movie. You know? And, and I'm not even scared of spiders. Spider. No. It's all the little tiny spiders because, like, I'll never see that movie, so I can easily imagine. But at the same time, I did see Harry Potter, yeah. and there is a scene in one of the Harry Potters where there's that huge giant spider, and then all the fifty million little yeah. spiders. That's just. <laughs> I like spiders. Spiders are very yeah. Cool I I like spiders too. Just I don't. I'm not. I don't have arachnophobia. You know, but when you're mm -hmm. five years old, it's very different. Yeah. You know. Well, no, but you can you can like spiders and still be afraid of spiders. Yeah. Like, you know, they're in my room and I let them stay here. I'm just like, yeah, I, I like you. You can stay. But when I see one crawling on my wall, I'm like, yeah. okay, we're cool. We're cool. But I'm just scared. You just scared me for a second. Let's do. Let's make the notes. When right. I lived in China, it was really funny because there was one time where the kids were going crazy. I was teaching at the front of the class and there's a big window behind me. And the kids were going crazy and I was like, what's going on? Why are you freaking out? Turned around. It was just a frog on the window. Yeah. But they're like really conditioned to be afraid of animals. Yeah. Weird. Like even like dogs and stuff, it's not that common, right? Um, so anyways, 
I went out, brought the frog in, and I kind of did like a little lesson about the frog. But even my co Chinese co teachers were like, ah, they were all like terrified of this little frog. Um, anyways, two or three weeks later, same thing. They're all freaking out about something behind me. And I turned around and I was like, it's a giant huntsman spider. They're like twice as big as my yeah. hands, like this, right? Huge. And I'm like, okay, that's a reason to be scared. Those things are terrifying. Yeah. I looked it up. They're totally harmless. Yeah. They don't do anything. They don't hurt anybody. They're just fast and they're huge. So my co-teachers were about to like smack it with a broom. And I'm just like, no, we don't want it falling on our heads or anything like that. Just leave it alone. Yeah. It'll find a place to run to. Leave it on the ceiling. Like, you know, we're fine. It's a big yeah. room. It's a very big room. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. So we got a tangent going on here. Let's fix that. See, Otis is clueless. He's just like, yeah, whatevs, man. What's going on now? <laughs> I was a demigod. Now, then I was a senti god. Now, what's going on? Um, yeah, he's just kind of going with the flow, I guess. Um, oh, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna use effects. Oh, look at this hot effects action. Nice. Yeah. Snaps. Snaps for the effects action. Yeah. Let's see. I gotta move it over though. I gotta remember how to move it over. All right, we'll do that. We'll move you down a little bit. Like that, all right. And then I gotta make a layer. I have to merge with the layer be below it. That's gonna go in here. And then we are basically everything above that and then um you know i'll figure out some lines you know to to like have them over but some of them are gonna go in front why i'm taking so much time on these panels you know it's already 752 and i'm only on panel two well was didn't we just do three panels last time too i don't think it's the end of the world yeah i know Is i it? just i just want to make sure that i'm i'm uh you know delivering a viable product in in my content creation Um, who's gonna say anything? I don't know. Anybody who actually, like, watches the show. I guess no one wants to watch tonight. We haven't had anybody. Yeah. Well, it is a Saturday. It was bound to happen. Uh, yeah, I suppose. At least that's how I see it. We should start thinking about any guests we might want. Um, yeah, uh... Or do you think that's too cluttery? No, I, I think that it would it definitely help move the story along, you know, to, to have, mm -hmm. like, more people contributing to what happens. Um, also, mm -hmm. give some, uh, someone to talk to while the drawing's going on. Sure, yeah. yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah, I think that would be a good idea. I uh, There used to be a bunch of people involved with the show back in Minneapolis that I'm still friends with. And so mm -hmm. I, I thought, like, having them on and then uh there's a bunch of artist friends that i have in the comic industry a bunch of artist friends you have in the comic industry you know and we could have them just like talk up their stuff let's see okay i i'm gonna call that one done oh wait 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 yeah no i like that wait i gotta do one more thing music notes everything is good no not everything is good what my uh there now you can read it i had lines over the words oh i was wondering what that was i figured you knew what was going down well, there yeah see but i i fixed it that looks much better yeah. um and then after it saves let's do this let's make a new panel yeah um panel three
It's too bad there wasn't a way to get random people on board. Um, what we used to do is, uh, in Minneapolis, is we had a phone number on the bottom of the screen, and people used to call in, and we would talk to them. And so, mm -hmm. but with the internet, I don't know if I want to do that. Right? It was mm, it was no, rough enough in um, Minneapolis without a call screener, and so like having having the entire internet there that could call mm -hmm. in like mm, you know yeah no i wouldn't give out any phone yeah, numbers i have but i just feel like maybe someone if someone's bored if they knew that this was happening they might want to be involved but yeah you're right why invite scary things yeah um i uh i do have a discord <laughs> yeah i do have a discord uh that does have a voice chat set up but I haven't used it for Philo yet because I want to invite certain people into that Discord. You know, yeah. I, I don't want to invite everybody into the Discord, but then just say, hey, I'm, I'm doing it. And then they can be in the Discord and then we can hear them on the show. Mm -hmm. But I just haven't done that yet. So. Um, what happens next? What happens okay. Next? Um so he he split into four he lost cohesion and, and split into four so uh well this is happening because they're hungry they haven't eaten yet except for the puma yeah um um i think the puma scares the guy in the ice cream truck trying to get out the ice cream i realized i forgot something i, for I forgot the hat how did you know <laughs> there we go because I'd be I'd be eager to stop drawing it as well. Um, yeah, there's nothing against the hat. It's just uh, you know I uh, I always have to remember to draw it. You know, it's like Spider Man's costume. It's like, okay, what does this costume look like again? Where are the lines connected to? You know, and um, which version am I drawing? Yeah, which version of the costume am I drawing? That's why I like the black costume. It's the easiest to draw. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Simplest. Yeah. Uh, uh, have you seen that comic where it's the two, it's the artist and the writer at a convention and the writer says, I love comics because I can, you know, have a huge crowd scene and explosions and all this stuff and it doesn't cost me a dime, right? And then the artist, mm -hmm. the next panel goes, I'll kill you! <laughs> yes. He's the one that's got to draw exactly. all those heads and those explosions and those crowd yeah, scenes. Exactly. And it's the, like, yeah. um, Poor guy. Now, uh, Todd McFarlane, he definitely used the Marvel method. He would like draw out the pages, kind of think out the story while he's drawing out the pages. He would literally lay them on the floor and put them in different orders that they flowed better, right? You know, um, because he did cool art and then he might have changed his mind, but he didn't want to throw out the art. And so he would like throw the kick in, you know, later on in some other fight that he invented yeah. just so he didn't have to scrap the page. And uh, 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 e that even be even that being said, right? And Todd McFarlane wrote for himself. He still wrote scripts. And mm -hmm. there is this one double page spread in one of the the Spider-Man comics where um, the the page before it are these long skinny panels where it's like zooming um, out of the city you know, from like someone's face and it zooms out and then you turn the page and he utilized the page flip where you have this this huge grand splash page of uh, uh, Spider-Man, you know, double pages of Spider-Man over the city with people walking below him, right? Yeah. Well, it, that was like two sentences when um, Todd wrote it down. He said, you know, splash page of Spider-Man, you know, over city or whatever like that in a script, right? And it took them the yeah. entire time, the entire 30 days that he was working on all of those pages to finish that page. Cause he started that page first and he finished that page last because he knew it was important. Good old Todd. Good old Todd. Yeah, uh, he's, oh, we got some action on cat cam. Are they fighting? Uh, fight, I don't fight, know. Fight. Let's see. I got another cat up Yeah, here. Mine, mine decided to leave, so no one's bugging me right now with their fur bellies. Well, I have two cats up on my desk right now. Yeah, I'll do that. So, I don't know. He's just sitting there. I don't... You can see his shadow. 
Yeah. Yeah. Go to do some smacking. There he is. Ah, I see his head. Yeah, there he is. <laughs> Get an ear in there. Yeah. I just had to scratch the right spot. Okay, so what happens next? So, uh, we have... Well, I think we should look at the perspective of the ice cream dude. Well, he's just driving by. You know? He's not going to stop and feed them? He doesn't know about them. He's just driving by. You know? No, he's got to stop and feed no, them. No, they're the ones that have the hunger problem. The ice cream man is... is he's, he's in another county already. He was just driving by. Um... Is the is the exploding happening inside? Yes. Okay. Um. Um. I mean, I I did action lines. You know, if you want to see the the panel again. <laughs> no, I think it's. <laughs> I'm just trying to think. Uh. Oh, well, what? Okay. Yeah. Um. Let's see. Okay, so they're all separate. Would they be like excited to be separate, or you know? Oh yeah, definitely. But I'm thinking about the tribunal and maybe they're being exasperated. Um, the tribunal. Well, the tribunal would have to uh, dis uh, disband, right? Because there's no yeah. kaiju to. But that's try. annoying. Like everything's been a complete waste of time. So maybe they're pissed at Godzilla for wasting their time. Oh, I like that. Okay, so. And then, like, uh, Manil Manila can gloat. Let's see. Um, the tribunal is... I should probably capitalize tribunal. Tribunal is mad at Godzilla for wasting everyone's time. And we'll put it up here like I totally planned it that way. Yeah. There we go. Alright, so they're mad at Godzilla now. So I imagine you said you want to see Manila gloat. Well, yeah, I mean, he's there. I think he would, because he's his adopted son, and he essentially we kind of won, not literally, but he did. You win. know, there's like three different designs of Manila. How frustrating! You mean he doesn't look like a frog? And there's there's Manila, and there's Baby Godzilla, and then there's Godzilla Junior. So Godzilla has a well, whole Godzilla adopted. family. Yeah, but Manila's adopted. He's not an actual genetic uh, fam familial member of Godzilla's family. Yeah. I just, uh, I wanted to make sure I wasn't going to draw Godzilla Jr., you know, because he's a completely different being than Manila. Let's see. There we go. So, uh, let's see. The tribunal is mad at Godzilla. So, if they're mad at Godzilla, what are they doing? They're, I guess you said looking exasperated? Yeah. Like, man, you wasted our time, right? Uh, they would be like glary, right? Yeah, and I think one would be turning away to leave. Like, in a huff. Wait. Okay, so I'll have Manila over here. Oops. I have to be on my sketch layer. I'll have Manila over here. Right? Grabbing his belly and laughing. That's a good yeah, one. So he's going to be a ha ha. Right? With his tail. And then um, I think we're going to have Mothra. Mothra, Ga Gamera, and then. Um, uh, King Kong for the tribunal. Yes. So we're just going to have Mothra fly away, I think. You know? Like, but we'll give him angry eyes as he flies away. Mothra flies away. Well, why shouldn't Mothra fly away? You know? His entire afternoon was ruined. For all we know, he lost his tea time. 
Do you want to see the comic I got for my double shift yesterday? Sure. Look how thick it is. It's like 500 pages. That is a graphic novel. Yep. It's actually a graphic memoir. Ooh. It says, I'm so glad we had this time together. It's by uh, Maurice Velikoop. He's a Toronto illustrator, cartoonist who's been around since like the early 90s. Yeah. He's very, very good. But very stylized. I'm, I'm just kind of drawing the robe flying, you know, because Mothra's not in it anymore. Are you going to look for a second? Yes! Ooh! Here, I'm going to put you in the big window. Ooh! I like the portrait work. Yeah. Talking heads. Yeah. He's very... His work is actually really, really good. Mm -hmm. Very cool. But it's like I said, it's very, very stylized. Like he he has a definite um like this is very indicative of his style here. Yeah. And check it out, there's Margaret Atwood. Huh. But that's him there with his boyfriend. Aww. Yeah, uh, Margaret Atwood's Canadian, isn't she? She sure is. Yeah. Lots of Canadians. She was one of the Amongst first you. to use the long pen. Okay. Uh, the long pen allows you to be able to draw or write something from a great distance, right? It's a device that whatever you draw and write on this end is translated over to the other end and it draws, writes it. And so because wow. her health has been failing in the last few years, um, I, I, I want to say for the last like 15 years, she, she can't do as many appearances as she used to. So what she does is she uses the long pen to write, uh, you know, personalized messages to people going to basically book signings where she's not really there. She, there's a screen with her and, and she's talking with them via, you know, chat. And then she'll, she'll write the inscription on their book, but they have to lay it in front of the pen. And so, uh, yeah, there's Mothra. And then, um, Gamera. We're just gonna have Gamera walking away. Because it's easier to draw that. Because then I just have to draw the shell and not like the front. What's your favorite kind of, uh, I realize I'm, I'm, let me put the artwork here. Uh, what's your favorite kind of comic? Well, for the longest time, it was autobiographical for the longest, longest time. Like that was like the first thing that grabbed me. Um, but I kind of got bored with it after a while, like after about let's say 20, 20, yeah, about 20 years, I got tired of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I don't know what my favorite kind is now because the thing about comics that I really love is that there's so many different kinds of comics. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't have to pick a favorite because they keep putting out great comics. Yeah. Um, I love, I, I'm a sucker for art a lot. So like with Marvel comics, for example, a lot of my favorite things are because of the artist and I know it'll be good. I'll just grab it. If, if I like the mm -hmm. artist, um, yeah, I don't know my all time favorite comic that there's two, actually, I really love, um, beautiful stories for ugly children. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever seen that comic. It's not really a comic. It's more like stories with illustration, but it was published by a branch of DC Comics called Piranha Press. Mm -hmm. And they're just really darkly hilarious stories. And the illustrations are kind of like um, Ralph Steadman-ish, but in their own style, the mm -hmm. artist's own style. So I love beautiful stories for ugly children. And then the other one that's my all-time favorite that I'm starting to realize that I just 
because I can't let go of it is uh Chris Ware's building stories. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that? Um yeah, I've seen some of it where he's he's talking. Uh that originally started as part of an illustration of this American life. And and yeah, I think so, yeah, and yeah. so it was an episode of This American Life where uh by the way, I have a cat over my mouse pad right now. Um that's not on camera. Yeah. Like, like if I move the camera, you can see he's right there, but you can't like, I can't move it too far. And I probably just lost like my perfect shot that I had. Uh, there we go. There you go. You got it. For the most part. It's a little, it's a little high. There we go. Yeah, but I got two cats up here now. Um, okay, so we got that. Uh, there's Gamera. Uh, I'm going to have... Uh, here's King Kong going away. and He's going to be throwing his robe up in the air. You know, because all their time's wasted. And then, um, is Gamera bigger than Godzilla? I think so. Isn't he one of the biggest of them all? I want to say so. Or is it? No, I think Biolante is the biggest. Well, okay. According to this particular image of Gamera versus Godzilla, uh, Godzilla is slightly taller than Gamera. So I'm going to go off of this image. And, and say that that is what uh, that that's the height right there and so we're gonna have Godzilla I guess right here in the middle you know he's gonna be looking all sheepish as sheepish as Godzilla can look right yes okay all right he's laughing and then um, we'll have like Philo down here a really small Otis the dog. Okay. Now let me actually start drawing this thing in. I'll start with Mothra. Let's start with Mothra. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to have Mothra angry. Why shouldn't he be? I don't know. Is Mothra a female? I would like it to be a female, but I don't think it is. Is it Japan in what the fifties, the sixties? No. Uh I I think sixties was Mothra. Uh Godzilla was definitely fifties though. Yeah, let's see, we're just gonna do that. Let's do our little Thing, and then oh I gotta take more cold medicine I'm feeling it I'm trying to figure out who the biggest one is and they keep showing me like video the video game kaiju video game kaiju yeah Is there a video game where you play kaiju? Oh, major monster versus kaiju. Here we go. Uh, Warbat looks like one of the biggest. Warbat? Yeah, it's from Godzilla versus Kong. Hmm. Like, are we talking about the 1970s Godzilla vs. Kong, or are we talking about the most recent one? Rodan is pretty huge, but I think, no, I think Warbat's the biggest. Uh, it looks like it is, uh, 428 feet long. Wow. That's like a battleship. I don't know, it just says Godzilla vs. Kong. Let me look at the picture and see if it's new looking or old looking. It's new looking. I would say the newest one. Hmm. They always War have to rock. make them bigger, don't they? Yes. 
the, the oh. rules of the kaiju. Didn't the tribunal teach you oh, that? Oh, look at that angry, angry looking Mothra. That's a beautiful Mothra. You like my Mothra? Yeah, I think, I think my Mothra turned out pretty good. Uh, and then... One year when I was working at Fabricland, this girl came in and she was going to make, a, and she did it. It looked really good. She made a costume of that moth that's like yellow, neon yellow and neon pink. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was really pretty. Yeah. She did it with like fleece and feathers and stuff. Mm. Let's see, we'll do that. I kind of missed that job. I was ideally suited for that job, but it was such a crappy company to work for. Yeah, I had uh, experiences like that as well, where it's like, this is a great job, but I am i don't like the people I'm working for. Um, mm -hmm. There was one time when I was making um, uh, armor for a like wearable space marine armor for a, a short sci-fi. And... Uh, yeah the uh uh sorry i lost my camera um the uh 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 guy i was working for cut my budget halfway through halfway through the project right so it's like he cut my budget and it, it was originally supposed to be about ten thousand dollars and then like i'm halfway building these things he's like no your budget's five thousand dollars it's like you want me to make what? Stop I'm like, that's yeah, I literally stopped building and I didn't work with him again. Yeah. Um here's your five thousand dollar armor. Uh what I did is I gave him everything that I had completed up to that point. You know? And I'm like, because you paid for the materials, so here's the materials. You can salvage it however you want. Mm -hmm. And uh yeah, I, I think they were expecting me to just take it. You know, yeah, but, some people will try to, but you know, the thing is, is that starts cutting into my labor. Right. And I, had, mm -hmm. I'd spent well over $5,000 on materials. So I said, if you cut it, then you're just buying the materials, not my labor. Mm -hmm. So here mm -hmm. you go. And your expertise. It's not just your yeah. labor. Yeah. And so it's, it's one of the projects I walked away from and I don't talk to the uh director anymore you know because he uh you know he got blamed for it when i walked away he and i used to be really close friends but his mm -hmm. producer was the one that was cutting everyone's pay and budget and you know d saying make it work and i i hated it i hated working for that guy yeah but it's like that's not what you signed up yeah. for so why should you be the one forced to make it work yeah yeah, exactly. Just be honest from the beginning and then maybe you'll get what you want. Da, da, da. I feel like an idiot because I've never seen it, but I never realized that Pacific Rim was about those like Godzilla monsters. Yeah, I, I never saw um, a Pacific Rim either, but I did include the Slattern uh, a kaiju mm -hmm. from Pacific Rim as the ba uh, bailiff or, you know, the security, I guess. I don't know. The the dude who brought uh, Sentagod to the courthouse. Yes. Kitty's getting comfy. Yeah. Oh, let me stop getting comfy. Oh, let me see if I can reframe Kitty. Here. Oh, yeah. I was moving it against his shoulder from where he turned. Yeah, it looks like it's probably going to be another three panel night. Yeah, if. Well, I mean, I'm trying not to draw like super detail, but that's just who I am. Well, we did include like four different kaiju. So. Yeah, that's what slowed me down last time. This time, at least I had my reference up. I didn't have to go looking for him. Yeah, when we originally did the, when we originally did the show, we uh, didn't have any reference, and so people would ask me to like draw Homer Simpson. I had to do it from memory. That would not be fun. I'd be so mad yeah. about that if I were you. Because then you're like, I want to do a good job, but how I 
Well, I mean, it was live on the air. I also would, would do like, you know, gosh, 15 panels an episode in an hour instead of an hour and a half. So I wasn't drawing very well at all. It's a good thing that we're doing it our yeah, way. Yeah, our way. Okay. Yeah. And then I will give him, this is his robe. He's just going to be dragging that. Do that so it's dragging in front. Yeah, there we go. So he's carrying that, and then um, I guess Godzilla is going to be here. I have to I have to draw Godzilla kind of looking stupid, you know. Or sad. Because he's a failure. Why? I I don't think Godzilla... I I don't know. Is Godzilla intelligent? I like, um, uh, yeah, I think of him like Sam the Bald Eagle. You know how like Sam the Bald Eagle's always trying to like get people in trouble? And he's not stupid, but he's not... He's always kind of screwing up. Yeah. To be like self-righteous and... I don't know, like, Godzilla's point of attack is basically destroy a bunch of buildings, mm -hmm. um, use your, your breath, right, to destroy said buildings, uh, use your tail, your arms, and stuff like that. It's not like he's building guns, you know, it, it's... That's he, true. I don't know if Godzilla's very intelligent, like, himself, you know, it, he gets... They walk him into traps all the time. I've not watched any Godzilla movies. I think I've seen Godzilla once on Mystery Science Theater, maybe? Uh, they have the Gamera. I've watched a bunch of them. They have Gamera. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let's see. And then we'll, we'll have him there. And then, uh, Manila. Manila. I don't think uh, uh, King Kong is going to make it. I don't think I have room for King Kong. Yeah. So Manila is just going to be like... Oh, you know what you could do? In the top right-hand corner, have like King Kong's foot. Because he swung out of the picture because he's a giant gorilla. Eh, maybe. Let's see. Can I do this? And kind of have that bulge there with the sad manila eyes that look like they're made out of paper mache. There we go. Yeah, quite episode. I like it when people play with us. Yeah, it's much more fun. I agree. But, you know, today was weird. Like, the whole week was kind of weird. Like, we had a holiday on Monday called Family yeah. Day. I don't know what you guys have, if you had anything like that. But then everything was, like, every both of my jobs, everybody was kind of, like, discombobulated. Hmm. Even today. Let's see. Let's do this. And he has kind of smooth skin, but we're still going to give him his little bow tie. And ha ha ha. You're so bad. Instead of drawing the other robe, why don't you draw a gavel? Smaller, easier to draw, faster, um, accurate. Because everybody's got a there's a robe in the sky already, and uh, what's his face has a robe in his hand. That's Gamera, by the way. Thank you, Gamera. I forgot. Momentarily forgot. Here, his name. I'll do that. I'll give him a gavel. 
And then I can do that. And what else do I need? The podium where they would have talked about the trial. Yeah, okay. We can put that back here. We can't see Ultraman, but this is still Ultraman. Okay, do that. It looks like it's all official. Okay, and then do that. So it's like this is the side. And, um,. Ken said whenever he didn't know what to put on the walls, he always picked curtains. That's <laughs> Cur Yeah, that's Ken Penders. Uh, he was kind of my comic mentor growing up. Um, I met him when I was working as an assistant manager at a bookstore. And so they sent me down to the day by day calendar kiosk where, you know, all the, the seasonal calendar kiosks. And so I was down yeah. there working on my comics. And so he came up and mm -hmm. bought a Star Trek calendar and we started talking Star Trek. And I'm like, you know, he's like, oh yeah, I draw comics. I'm like, I draw comics too. See? <laughs> and so he was like, oh, I actually need an assistant. You're not bad. And so um, we've been friends since. And I was probably about cool. 15 at the time. Yeah. And he took a chance on you. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, my first job that I, I did for him was black spotting um, for uh, Sonic the Hedgehog comics. You know, just nice. It's just, you know, he had finished inking a bunch of stuff and all the black spots need to be filled in. And he basically went, here you go. Here's, here's your Sharpie. Screw that up. <laughs> yeah. In. So, yeah, so we'll do that. Uh, that's that. I'll put like a little witness box in the side. So it looks like it's like judgy. And then, um, yeah, we'll put a little like microphone in there there yay yeah and so uh yes the tribunal is mad at godzilla for wasting everyone's time i guess i'm gonna have to draw more of a godzilla kind of looking sheepish look here i don't know if godzilla can look sheepish Uh, we are right there at eight, at uh, 828, by the way. So we did three panels yeah. tonight. You know. A record. a record! Yeah! Two nights in a row. Same three yeah. panels. Um, let's review what we did. Uh, we talked a lot. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, oh, wait. Where's my tribunal? That should be in here. There we go. So, yeah, Manila and Godzilla have their opening statements, right? And there's the Senegod on the side. And then outside in the ice cream trucks, music splits Senegod apart. Oh, wait, wait, wait. We got to say due to hunger. Because we, we didn't establish that they're hungry. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But it could be the music vibrations. It's an awfully small vibrating medium. Yeah, it's yeah. true, because they're not really close. Yeah, so, uh, yes, I will leave that. And then, um, outside an ice cream truck's music split Senegal apart due to hunger. So there he is splitting apart. And then the tribunal is mad at Godzilla for wasting everyone's time. And so we don't even have, like, Philo and all of them in this panel. Should we draw them in? Do we no. have time? Do we have room? We'll be in the next one. Okay. They'll be in the next okay. one. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll... It's too cluttered, right? You don't want it to be too cluttery, and I think it looks great the way well, it is. Well, I do want to draw in, you know, some edamata. <coughs> um, but yeah, I, I've been in bed all day, and so I'm, I'm probably Me. heading back there because <laughs> I'm sick. <laughs> 
Me too. I'm about to pass out, yeah. man. Uh, but Ready to sleep. but it, we, I think we had a good night. We're stopping at a good spot, yeah. and um, I don't have to draw. You got some good art. Done. I don't have to draw as many kaiju next next time. So that's yes, they that's will just be almost out of the story. <laughs> We still have the scented god. I mean, it's like four four characters, five essentially. If you have to do Voodoo again, I don't know. We'll figure it out. But uh, okay, yeah, I am uh, gonna put on. I'll try. I'll try to rabble rouse some people for next week's episode. <laughs> yeah, get some guests. Yeah, we'll uh, uh, we'll touch base of the week. Um, okay, let me put up the graphic. There's the graphic, and um, I'm gonna turn off everything. Uh, have a good night. We'll see you in the future.